you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Lord, thank you that you are the God that upholds. You are the God that lifts up. You are the God that is the foundation of every hope that we have. So, Lord, in light of eternity, there really is no reason to fear. And yet, because of the troubles of this world, we do. So, Lord, we ask for your help. We ask for your encouragement. We ask for you to, to lift us up again. Amen. Let's sing to him. the <laughs> Oh, they're talking. Oh, Thank you. 
Down on my knees, sir, surrendering all. Surrendering. And that's before you. I Verse three. Thank <laughs> you. 
Just take a moment to offer up our sacrifice of praise, to offer up our hearts this morning, just silently. Just use this as a time of reflection and as the spirit leads, a time of confession. If there's anything that you would be holding on to that prevents you from entering into the presence of God this morning. Let's just do that. Hope we ask for your help. Lord, help us, Lord. Relieve us of the burdens that hold us down. Lord, our, it is our desire that we fix our eyes on you this morning and you alone. Lord, whatever would distract us, whatever would hold us back, would loose us of those chains. Like a rushing wind, Jesus breathe away. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way in me. Like a mighty storm, so so I surrender. I surrender. I surrender. I want to know you more. of life steaming shameful sin placed on him the heart of every man the blood of Jesus washes me the blood Jesus shed for me. Yes, the 
was to save your son. Yes, the love victory. And oh, what love! Greater grace, how can it be? Yes, the blood is not a Yes, the blood is We are assured of this very thing, that he who did not spare his own son would also along with him give us everlasting life. So Lord, we cling to that promise, Lord, we are debtors to your mercy, we're debtors to your grace, and nothing else. Lord, receive our praise, receive our thanks this morning. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Please have a seat. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Che Kim, and I'm the EM pastor here at Cleveland KCPC. Hope you're growing in Christ during these uh, difficult days. Um, just want to welcome those who are new uh, today. There's a thing called Super Bowl. I've made five predictions since I've been here at KCPC, I've been right one out of five times. I'm like that groundhog that always gets it wrong in terms of predicting the spring. I'm going to base my prediction on Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11. I return and saw under the sun that the race isn't to the swift. Okay? It might not be pretty today, but I think I'm picking San Francisco to win. Okay? I've been wrong four out of five times. Okay? And so... Take that to the bank. And so if San Francisco loses tonight, just say that it was my fault. Just a few announcements. College Young Adults and Agape, uh, if you want to get involved with their Bible studies and community and fellowship, please let the leaders know or myself know or any of the elders. It'd be good if you can uh, join our small group community. Also, Building Hope in the City, I've, I've dropped off a lot of clothes the past six weeks. So I want to thank you. And, and they're very thankful. So if you have more, especially coats and shoes and socks, it'll be great. 
especially during this time of the year when it's cold outside, there's always a need. I don't know if you smell the sweet aroma of Christ at this time. We have food today, okay? Really one of my favorite soups, okay? And so they are serving that today. And so let's thank all those, all the hands that made it. It's going to be our turn soon, sometime later this year. At this time, we're going to have a time of offering. We have a time of offering at this time. But offering, we are just continually thankful for the life you give us here, the eternal life that the kingdom of God here. Uh, we thank you so much, Father, for the promises of Scripture. We thank you so much for many of us who have a generous heart, and I pray our hearts will become more and more generous. None of this is ours; we're just stewards of what belongs to you. We thank you that this this offering will be be given to to uh, proclaim your kingdom to extend your kingdom, for people to be uh, blessed in the kingdom. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, if we could all stand and let us join together in confessing our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Knowing that we've all sinned and fall short of God's glory, let us confess our sins to God together in silence at this time. Friends, believe in the good news of Jesus Christ. In him we're forgiven. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Sit down this time. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that the kingdom of God is here. Not fully, but we have now a beachhead into enemy territory. And we thank you so much, Father, your goodness and your righteousness, your joy, mentioned so clearly in the summer and amount. May that be our vision and purpose here at this church, that the world is better because of this church. And all the churches around the world, Lord, Scripture makes it very, very clear that the hope of humankind is rooted, Father, in your grace and all these divine uh, people, Father, who love you. 
and we have this divine purpose, Father, to spread shalom wherever we are. Lord, I pray continually, Father, for our church to wake us up from our slumber, physically and most important, spiritually. I pray, Father, that this message today, as we could talk about the kingdom of God, Father, will we unite the souls of those who've been asleep. And I pray, Father, convict us may, uh, for us to repent, for us to go along that journey, Father, that might be difficult, that will be difficult, the road less traveled, Father, but the road to salvation and eternity. We thank you, Father, those, Father, that we can pray for those who are suffering, for those going through a difficult time and hopelessness. And I pray, Father, that, uh, that we'll continue to be faithful to praying for our people who are going through difficult times. And for those who are going through difficult times, may there be glimmers of hope, injections of hope, knowing that we have a great high priest that can sympathize and empathize with all of our weaknesses and, and, and our sins. We thank you, Lord, that, that we can pray to you constantly, that you gave us the motto of all prayers that you taught us 2,000 years ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We could all turn to, this is short, um, Mark chapter 1, verse 14 to 15. Mark chapter 1, verse 14 to 15. Mark 1, verse 14 to 15. After John was put into prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This is the word of God. Today's passage, today's sermon is actually pretty deep and, you know, a little bit maybe complicated. And so there's, i just be very straight up with you. I wouldn't get a little bit more deep, a little less entertainment value. You, for those who are heavily into deep meditation, generally on Sundays, uh, this is going to give you more opportunity to be deeply more in med meditation. So I ask. You can sleep, but do not snore. If someone snores, I think it's totally biblical to use that elbow, okay, to wake them up, okay? And so please, um, today's sermon is going to be a little bit deeper, a little less entertainment value, okay? Because it, it, it comes to, the, uh, to a very deep, the most top, the, the most sermons that Jesus talked about, and the thing he talked about the most, I said this over again, is the kingdom of God. And the second most is about the the about the dangers of loving money. And so I kinda, that kind of gives you a hint what this is about, right? And so I wanna start with a question. What is the gospel that Jesus preached? If someone to ask you that question, how will you respond? If someone asks you just point blank, you know, that's the great thing about kids. They ask you very these simple questions, but they're very, they're very difficult questions to answer. What would you say the gospel of Jesus Christ is, okay? I think the vast majority of people in America who are Christians will not give the same answer as the Bible gives an answer to what the gospel is. What is the one message, the gospel of Jesus Christ? What was he talking about? And it starts here in the book of Mark and Luke as well. It says, Jesus went to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. That's the message that Jesus brought. Okay, and so once Jesus close, chose his disciples, that was his one goal in life, those three years that he preached. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a series of verses real quickly to establish this truth. That phrase, I want you to keep get, getting, in, you know, noticing that phrase, the kingdom of God. First one, after Jesus traveled from one town to another, he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God. Second one. When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to cure, drive out demons, and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God. Another one, after Jesus rose from the dead and gathered his followers together, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And the last one, 
And this is the last thing that Paul says in the last chapter of Rome, um, Acts 28. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached about the kingdom of God. Okay? And so if you're going to say what Jesus' gospel is in one phrase, what's the answer? The kingdom of God. More specifically, in your Bible, it might say the good news of the gospel. And you know what that means? That means that ordinary people like us can now enter the kingdom of God. You can live in it, in it if you want to. You can right, walk right into it if you want to. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's the only gospel that he ever preached. But I am increasingly frustrated because I think it's so tragic in American churches specifically that millions and millions of other Christians in our day have substituted another kind of gospel. They will never say this, but this is what they're thinking. And I remember meeting with Anna Ceballos uh, you know, recently and how a lot of American churches think this is what the gospel is. The minimal entrance requirements to get into heaven when you die. What are the minimal entrance requirements to get into heaven when you die? They'll never say that, okay, that somehow the gospel is, okay, these are the minimal entry requirements to get into heaven, okay? Um, I've used this story before. Um, as you know, I like older movies, and some of those who are my age, you know this. And, and this is not a theological deep film, okay? And I would in no way encourage you to write, watch this, okay? There's a lot of in, inappropriate things. with Monty Python and the Church for Holy Grail, okay? I think it's so funny, but don't watch it, okay? <laughs> Doing that so that you will watch it. But anyway, it's about King Arthur, and, they, and it's not nice like Lancelot. They, they look for the Holy Grail. And there's one specific scene when they, they, they want to go into this castle, but there's this huge abyss between where they are and the castle. Okay, and this, they call this the bridge, right? It's the bridge of death, okay? And there's a gatekeeper, this old, uh, you know, crotchety old man. And he says to Arthur and his knights, and they have to answer three questions and, to get it right. And they have to get it right or they cross over. If they get them wrong, they're cast into the abyss, okay? And so this is British humor. I love British humor, okay? And um, when it rains 350 days of the year, you'll have this kind of humor too. But the first night comes up and he's very nervous. And the old gatekeeper says, state your name. And you know, what's your quest? What's your favorite color? He says, my favorite color is red. And he gets to walk across the bridge of death. And he's like, you have now entered the kingdom. Or he doesn't say that, but you know, that's what happened. He's like amazed how easy it is. The second night comes up and he's really arrogant. He's been, he was very nervous before that. He says, what's, state your name. You know, you know, state your quest. He gets those two right. And then the gatekeeper asks this question. What's the capital of Syria? And he says, I don't know. And he casts down into the best. Oh, okay, it's a funny scene. The third night comes up and he's very nervous now. He's, the gatekeeper says, state your name. State your quest. He gets those two right. Then he stammers that out. What's your favorite color? He says, red, no blue. Ah, oh, okay. Okay, he gets the color wrong. And those colors has nothing to do with our political parties, okay? And so, but he's cast into bliss. And now finally, King Arthur comes up and he, he faces three questions. The gatekeeper says, what's your name? I'm King Arthur, King of the Britons. What's your quest? My quest is the pursuit of the Holy Grail. Then he asks this question and you kind of have to watch the film. It's sort of a running gag throughout the whole film. What's the airspeed velocity of a coconut laden swallow? What is the airspeed velocity of a coconut laden swallow? And the author's answer is also based on a running gag throughout the film. Well, it depends. Is it an African swallow or a European swallow? The gatekeeper says, I don't know that. And the gatekeeper is thrown into hell. <laughs> oh, okay. Now, if I'm the gatekeeper, I will ask the question, do you go to KCPC or not? I'm just kidding. That, that'll be a cult member. That'll be a cult leader. Okay. But a lot of people, we kind of, you know, we, we look at that as sort of a joke. It's kind of funny, right? But they kind of think that, the gospel is, this: as long as we have the secret answer to the correct question, that means that we can go into heaven, right? Isn't that what a lot of people think of the gospel? That what, what is the answer? What do I need to believe in, believe in to get to the other side? And the tragic result for so many Christians, especially American, American churches, there's no connection between their misunderstanding of the gospel and their life every day. And if you, if you ever read the Bible, the New Testament never says that. It never preaches that kind of gospel. 
It never says, what is the minimal interest requirements for getting into heaven when you die? Jesus never says that. But a, a thousand other churches in the world, especially in America, say that. I mentioned, I, I read this quote before years ago, but it's from Dallas Willard. It's called Vampire Questions. A lot of Christians in America are vampire Christians. This heresy has created the impression that it is quite reasonable to be a vampire Christian. One effect says to Jesus, I like a little, little of your blood, please. But I don't care to be your student or have your character. In fact, won't you just excuse me while I get on with my own life and I'll see you in heaven. But can we really imagine that this is an approach that Jesus finds acceptable? That was well a divine conspiracy. It never says that. It never says that in scripture. And I love what his other quote, and I, I have it up there. This is what he says. All the preliminaries have been taken care of. And the kingdom of God is now accessible to everyone. Review your plans for living and base your life on this remarkable community. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what he's saying is all the preliminaries have been taken care of. That means all the work that God did through the Old Testament to the people of Israel to kind of shape an understanding of who he is and what life is about, it all reached a fulfillment when Jesus came in Mark chapter 1, verse 14 to 15. That God's reign his power, his love, his kingdom is now available to you, to you who live in Glendale, California, to live in Ellicott uh, City, Maryland, to those who live in LA, even LA, okay? To those who live in Pepper Pike or, or Hoover, Alabama, is and even Little Rock, Arkansas, is available to you, okay? You know the word repent? It's kind of, we, like, we don't like that word repent. You know what it comes from? It's, Greek, it's from the Greek word metanoia. And basically means review your thinking. Rethink how you think so you can review the way you live. That's basically what it means. Repent. Think again how you're living and, and, and now live in the right way. That's the, cost, that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, before you throw stones at me, of course the gospel of Jesus Christ includes the promise of forgiveness for our sins. Of course it promises life after death and the resurrection that will live with him forever. Of course it brings, of course it includes all of that. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is so much more. He is the great kingdom bearer, bringer, okay? And of course, he died on the cross for our sins. That's very important. But that was part of his mission for all of us. And his overall mission for, is for us is to be divine agents of his kingdom. Do you know that? You know, you know Bond? You know, he's a, he, he, James Bond? He's a spy? In a sense, we're sort of an ambassador. We're kind of subversive agents of his divine conspiracy. That's what we're doing. You know, Matthew 6, that great sermon, and he talks about how we live the same kind of life, the same pathetic kind of life that the world lives. What am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What am I going to wear? What kind of job am I going to have? How much money am I going to have? How, how am I going to be successful? I mean, those foolish questions that we always ask. Everything's about my, about my kingdom. And how does Jesus respond in 632 in Matthew? For the pig is run after all these things. The pig is run after all these things. His point is, the irony is that Christians run after these superficial things as well. Okay? They spend their whole life running after these things. They're running a rat race. The problem is we're all rats. Any, any of you guys have pet rats? If you do, you need professional help. We're just a bunch of rats. That's all we are. But in verse 33, what does it say? But seek first his kingdom of God. And he's just telling us how to live life, which is simply the most wonderful life. Everything else will take care of itself. If you understood that one passage, seek his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these other things will be taken care of. You know, all these miracles that he did, he didn't do it to impress us about his power. It was to manifest the availability of the kingdom of God. And so what we're going to do at this time, for the next 20 minutes, we're going to be students of the kingdom of God. For those who've been to school, okay, the last five days, we're going to go to school again today. But today you get a free meal. And, this, this, and basically, we're going to think about it. I hope and pray that we'll be enamored by it. But because the kingdom of God is now available to ordinary, fallen, foolish, foolish sinful people like us. And I want you to today just get a basic understanding what the kingdom is about. Now, we live in 2024, and the kingdom is, when, when I say the word kingdom or queendom, 
It's very difficult for you to think of, of it in modern times, right? The moment I say kingdom, you think of castles or thrones or Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings. Okay, we, um, my family and I, we went to Disney World four months ago. And there was a castle. When you go in there, it's the castle of dread, financial burden. They take away your money and they never give it back. Okay, it fools people like us that we have to somehow, life is not complete if we don't take our kids there. That's the lie they, per they perpetuate. And that's the lie I was given into. Okay, but there's a kingdom there, the Disney kingdom, the kingdom of Disney. You know what a kingdom is? It's very simple. Everyone has a kingdom or a queendom. Your kingdom is that little sphere in which what you say goes. Okay, your kingdom is that little sphere in which you, what you say goes. Your kingdom is the range of effective will. Do you understand? It's your domain in which your will is affected, in which you rule. Okay? That's why people don't like being told what to do. That's why generally men don't like sermons. Because basically, what am I doing? I'm telling you what to do. Okay? And, and so spouses, they know, never say this out loud, maybe. You're not the boss of me. I have my kingdom. You have your kingdom. Stop trying to invade my kingdom with your forces. You can't tell me what to do. What's the favorite word of a two-year-old? No, right? Or maybe if he's a loving two-year-old, daddy, okay? No, his favorite word is no. What is he learning? He's learning he has his own kingdom, okay? Um, my kids, they sometimes fight in the back of our Honda CRV. And sometimes they're like, you know, especially my daughter's like, this is, she doesn't say, this is my kingdom. She's like, stop being so near me, Okay. Basically, she's saying, don't cross this line. This is my territory. This is my kingdom, my queendom. And they defend their little kingdoms, and they go to war. Sometimes there's a nuclear war happening in the back. Whose kingdom does that me think the car is? That Honda CRV is my kingdom. I'm driving that, okay, top speed, 60 miles an hour, okay? And sometimes I drive, I shouldn't, okay, I drive and do this. Okay, stop fighting, okay? And so my hand is part of my kingdom. And I do this, and they go in the corner. And then if they don't listen, I have my kingdom, my car. I push the brakes, and I say, thy kingdom come. This is my kingdom that has come. My kingdom is the range of my effective will. It's where things go the way I want them to do. And that's why God made you. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says, let us make mankind in our image. Then he says, so that they can rule. We were made to rule. That's kingdom language. Did you know that? You were made to rule. Whether you live in Glendale, California, or Hollywood, California, or, or Bergen County, New Jersey, you have a dominion. You have a sphere. And it's not just physical. It's not just physical domain. It's spiritual. It's emotional. It's relational. And so this is absolutely central to what it means to be a person. And when they get infringed upon, when that gets violated, you feel intimidated. You feel manipulated or controlled. And, and you feel like your person has been destroyed, right? So he doesn't give any animals dominion or rule. He gives us a charge to rule. But then what's, what's happened? This kingdom has jumped up our rule. And it's funny, this kingdom of the earth there's billions of kingdoms intersecting each other. It's not just people. There's corporations, your vocation, families, economic system, political structures, cultural systems, nations. There are networks of personal power and, and governmental power. And that's all a conglomeration. It's all called the kingdom of the earth. Do you know that? So let's do a contrast study for a moment, okay? There's a domain called the kingdom of God. There's a domain called the kingdom of the earth. And the kingdom of God is the range of God's effective will. And the simplest definition comes from the Lord's Prayer that we pray every Sunday. Your kingdom come, your will be done. C.S. Lewis says when we pray that, we really don't mean that. We really want my kingdom come. God, may you do my will. That's what we want. Because we think we are the ruler of our kingdom or queendom. But the kingdom of God is the sphere, domain in which God's will is, is done his approval, his delight, when things go precisely the way God wants them to do. It's not a geographic location like I mentioned before. He's omnipresent. 
He's not limited to space or, or special thing like that. It's the sphere. It's the realm. Okay, so that means when you're walking on case, the kingdom of God is right there if you enter into it. That's what's the beauty of Chronicles of Narnia. They entered the kingdom of Narnia. It's invisible, but it's always there. And so we all have all these kingdoms. And what does the kingdom of God look like? There's many. But one aspect is this. When the disciples, they were, you know, disciples were about anywhere from 18 to 25. They were a youth group. They were a youth group, college group. Did you know that? Peter was probably the, the oldest. He was the only one married at the time. And they're all about egos and powers and position, the same useless things that this world goes after. And they all ask Jesus this question. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? Because they're still used to the kingdom of the earth. And he says this, whoever humbles himself like a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That's a very surprising answer, right? Right? And the reason he says that isn't because that kids are perfectly humble. They're not. If you've been around a kid, they're not always humble. My son is not humble. He brags all the time. Some of you who judge me for that, I've seen your kids. Your kids brag all the time. Or if you're a Korean parent, an Asian parent, you brag about your kids all the time. Don't we do this in subtle ways? Oh, my son's not that smart. He went to Harvard. He's not that smart. He's second in the class. He's not that smart. Don't we do that subtle thing? We worship our kids. They're idols. Okay? But back, and so back in those days, kids had no power, no status. Now they rule the world. Disney World, Vegas for kids. What we spend there stays there forever, right? Isn't that their motto? And that's why three families are going to Disney Adventure of some sort in the next two months, like we did four, four months ago. But back in the good old days, the kids had no power. The good old days, right? And that's why when they try to see Jesus, the disciples blocked them. They're not high up on the ladder, literally, to see Jesus. And he says, this, the greatest in the kingdom of God are people who live for me. It has nothing to do with status, power, or privilege. Can you imagine society? This is beyond our thinking. In fact, when I say this, you're going to think I'm foolish. But this is what Jesus probably thinks. Imagine society where people just get on magazine covers. Okay? Not because they're prettier than everyone else or rich than anyone, or more powerful than anyone else, but because they're humble, okay? And these people are blessing the world. Imagine a society that we don't only look up to celebrities, okay? no big shots, no offense, no Taylor Swift, that we actually honor our mom more than a superstar. How, that, how great would that be, okay? Nothing, there's nothing wrong with her. She's dating someone from Cleveland Heights, but okay? But you know what I'm saying? The kingdom of God is like a banquet. You party animals, you think you know you invented parties? Party was God's idea. He invented parties. He said the kingdom of God is like the bank, it's a banquet. It's an unbelievable party of joy, and, and the blind, the lame are all invited to this community. It's an all-loving, inclusive community. Imagine when everyone is looking out for everyone else. There's no clicks, that everyone is prized, and they're all stuck at the wonder and beauty of God. Nobody looks unattractive because their eyes have learned is what Jesus, what God sees. And in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, it says this, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking. You know why he says that? Because back in those days, there were all kinds of rules and regulations about eating and drinking. It's not a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's about righteousness, peace, love, and joy. Imagine, that's what the kingdom of God is like. You know, some of you guys have Facebook and Instagram. You put food everywhere. Praise God. Part of me tells me, how in the world are you not gaining weight? Okay? Part of me tells me that maybe you're trying to make people think you're happy when you're not. Part of me tells me that you're just happy you're eating. Okay? Food that I can't eat. Okay? But how great would it be if you put posts? I think, sorry for pointing them out. Like Sam always puts these posts that makes me laugh. To me, that brings me joy. Now, how we can use social media for joy. Not envy and jealousy and showing off. Okay, and because in the kingdom of God, everyone lives with peace. There's no jealousy. There's security and confidence. There's no insecurity. Imagine being part of a community where there's no stress, knowing he's in control of all things. Okay, he wants us to be most humblest, most joyful. He wants us to live in the kingdom 
of the world of, of God. Don't you want to live in that kind of kingdom? I mentioned this before. Okay, Dallas Willis said this. If there was a system better for living than Jesus himself created, he would have followed that system. He gave us the best system how to live life. But no, we think we know more than God on how to live life. That was the gospel of the kingdom. And Psalm 145 says, the saints will tell the glorious splendor of your kingdom. We have diminished the beauty of the gospel. We made it like a mathematical equation. God has a wonderful plan for your life. Okay, but there's sin that keeps us away from God. But if you believe in this, if A equals B, B equals C, C equals A, or something like that. It's not. The gospel is full of wonder and beauty, never-ending humility, generosity, okay, joy, beginning with the Trinity, God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and extends to relationships with people. Okay, and so you and I who love God, we can now immerse in this, this, new, real, this new reality, a new kind of life. That's where we live. That's no matter what you're going through, you don't have to live in the kingdom of the earth. Now, physically we do, but we can enter the kingdom of God wherever we are. So what does the kingdom of the earth look like? Okay? You guys don't know this, but some of you, most of you guys don't know this, but I remember 30 years ago, Rwanda, you've heard of Rwanda? But 900,000 people were dead in 100 days. Systematic mass genocide. Okay, I remember that. You read the newspaper. I'm sorry, you don't read it. You watch a video or a news, okay? Numerous of atrocities every day. The WHO, World Health Organization, I, I looked it up in 2019. 5.2 million children under the age of five, under the age of five, died from preventable causes. Preventable, these could have all been preventable. 5.2 million kids die every year from malnutrition, lack of uh, drinking water, okay? That, I did the math. 14,246 kids are going to die today of preventable causes. I mean, for, we could prevent that. 14,246 kids are going to die are things that we can cure. Now, I, I don't like giving those stats because it makes us all feel guilty and helpless. And don't we spend a fair amount of time in our day not wanting to think about those kind of things, okay? But there's not a lot of good news in the kingdom of earth, is there? There's not. You watch, you watch news, 29 minutes of bad news, and at the end, it might have some feel-good story, right? It's not usually what it is. But have you, if you ever wept over stories like this or the face of a hungry child, if your blood has ever boiled over a story of injustice, or someone be not being treated fairly. You know what I mean? You know what that says? There's something deep in you knowing that this is not right. This cannot be ultimate reality. You're longing for the kingdom of God, this magnificent Jesus. And that's what he says in Matthew. Here's my plan to bring shalom. Okay? I want to invade this kingdom. I want to take away this kingdom little by little. And it, it's funny. It, it, you know, it, when the Lord's prayer says, my kingdom, thy kingdom come, that will be done. Okay? You understand it's not a spatial language. But basically what he's saying is, make your kingdom up there come down here. That's his plan. May your kingdom, the kingdom of the universe, come down here. All right? He never said this. God, get me out of here. Where's to say that? Um, I, um, I think... I think Phil told me, so some of you guys told me, I used to watch Star Trek a lot. You ever heard Star Trek? The, you know, Spock, I can't do it. I can't do it. You know, special, they got the pointed ears. This is before I, like I lost in the elves. But anyway, um, a lot of times we have Star Trek theology. You know, in Star Trek, you know, there's a guy named Scotty who's like an engineer. And whenever they're in the planet, beam me up, beam me up, get me out of here. A lot of us, we have Star Trek theology. Okay, like I'm suffering. I'm going through a difficult time. Let me get, get out of here. As opposed to bring heaven down to me down here. Bring heaven down to whatever I'm going through. Don't make me an escape artist. I, I'm going through a difficult time. But God, your kingdom is here. I can overcome this. So the, the, so the question that I want you to ask, ask you is this. I do want you to think about heaven all the time. But not as a way to escape the issues you have here on earth. You know, as they say, sometimes people are so heavenly minded, 
they're of no earthly good. Sometimes people are so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. But then opposite of that, some people are so earthly minded, they're not bound to heaven either. Okay? And so the good news of Jesus Christ is the kingdom of God is here. It's like a beachhead. Okay? Uh, you know anything about June 6th, D-Day? That was the beginning of the end for Nazi Germany. Okay, D-Day, June 6th. I was born 25 years after in a small city called Seoul, South Korea. Okay? But June 6th, 1944 is when the Allies invaded Normandy and started the end of the Nazi regime. And that was a beachhead. D-Day has come 2,000 years ago. The kingdom of God is here. But we still, the kingdom of God is not fully here. But it is still here. We've won the victory. But we still have to fight the battles. And so the kingdom of God has been prophesied from the very beginning. In Micah 2.12, I love Micah 2.12. I will surely gather all of you, O Jacob. I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel. I will bring them together like sheep in a pen, like a flock in his pasture, the place will throng with people. One who breaks open the way will go before them. They will break through the gate and go out. Their king will pass through before them, the Lord at their head. That's what the Old Testament is about. For centuries and centuries, God worked with one people. And his intent was always bless all people. Okay? And so the, the nation of Israel was sort of a remedial project. So he starts with one people, the Jewish people, so that they can understand a God and his laws and intent, how life should look like, what worship should look like. And then the king will come one day. He'll bring that kingdom, and all the Old Testament laws that no longer carries to this day will be abolished. And now we, we can see what the kingdom is. Everything else was a shadow. You know, the Old Testament, they call it come and see religion. The New Testament, the New Covenant, is go and tell religion. Now we tell people of the wonders of God. And you and I, are divine agents, secret agents, okay, of this divine kingdom. You are K, Ch Kim, Che Kim, okay, Park, Joseph Park. You are a, a, a divine agent, part of the divine conspiracy to reveal that this world is a scandal. What happens when there's a scandal? Truth is revealed that was hidden before and now it's open. We are revealing a scandal of the earth. So every time you bring a slice of life from here, the kingdom of God is breaking through. Every time you're in conflict with somebody, but there is reconciliation and, and forgiveness, the kingdom of God is there. Every time you make money, but you want to give those who are suffering, the kingdom of God is there. Every time you uh, include someone who's lonely, not only think about yourself and your little clique, the kingdom of God is coming. Every time you serve the under-resource, the kingdom of God is coming. And that's why we pray every Sunday, your kingdom come, your will be done, not us. We say, my kingdom come. May you bless my kingdom, right? But no, Jesus says, his kingdom come, his will be done. And he assembles a group of followers, and he calls it the church, and then people scatter from Jerusalem and Judea to the ends of the world, okay? And about 45 years ago, maybe 46, 47, I wasn't here, a little beachhead got established in their metro hospital. And then went to Brexville called KCPC. And there are cathedrals in London or England or underground churches in China, house churches, churches, even underground churches in North Korea. And that, I believe, the Bible says, no matter how many, mis many mistakes we made for 2,000 years, the church, not physical building, is the hope of humankind. Okay? How would you, how would you like to be, how would you like that? That you're not living for yourself. How would you like to meet Christ and says, thank you so much. You have been a great divine conspirator. Every one of you are conspirators. You conspire. You're, you, you're the subversive divine conspirators of the most high kingdom. Okay? And so you can enter the kingdom of God any moment. You're like, where, where is it? It's everywhere. No, we think of heaven as here. I mean, there and this is earth. Heaven is everywhere if you allow yourself to enter into it. So whatever you're going through, you can enter it. And that's my personal vision, just personally. Okay, I'll devote myself, okay, for this community that the one topic that I want you guys to remember when I'm long gone is that the gospel of the kingdom of God is available to everyone.
And that was his purpose for each one of you. Those who live in Chino Hills, Diamond Bar, Glendale, okay, Pasadena, North Olmstead, Olmstead Falls, Pepper Pike, Fullerton, even Fullerton, Bergen County, even Bergen County, Princeton, okay, Duke University, wherever you're from, okay, even Kirkland, okay, the Kirkland? Kirkland, oh, Kirkland, I think it's Costco, the kingdom of Costco, sorry, 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 Kirkland, Kirk, sorry, that's my idol, sorry, forgive me. Especially at Costco, the kingdom of God is there because the kingdom of God is all about joy and abundance, okay, amen? So remember, the kingdom of God, you can enter it any day, okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you. You're a great God. And you didn't just give us the secret answer to a question how to enter heaven. The gospel is so much more than that, that you died on the cross for our sins and you're resurrected and you gave us that same resurrected life. And now we have a mission because the kingdom of God is here. We are ambassadors of the most high king and our job is to bring others and we ourselves live in that kingdom, whatever we're going through. We thank you and praise you. May you use KCPC as divine agents of the proclamation of the kingdom of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You could all stand up and sing the last song. Mm -hmm. How great the castle, how great the castle that lay between us, how high I could not cry in desperation. Turn to and we Then came the morning that sealed the promise. You everybody began to breathe out of the silence. 
So I have to make these announcements, just five of them. One, uh, because we have lunch, if you could let the praise team kind of use the middle, so give them some space. Number two, if you can remember to take all the chairs out and bring out the tables. And if the, the families are young kids, if they could maybe kind of cut in line, okay, the kingdom of God belongs to the kids. Uh, another thing is, I'm not going to mention the person's name, but, you know, this food is not free, okay? Like, you know, back in the day, we had to, like, pay money, not the college kids because you guys are dirt poor, but everyone has to pay but we have actually a very, very generous family donor that paid for the rest of the year, okay? And so because of them, we don't have to pay anything. They have to pay, we don't, but the kingdom of God came into the house, okay? And so another thing, I need to meet with all the college uh, senior leaders, okay, if we eat lunch, it's kind of important. I want to talk to you guys. And lastly, I, I want to apologize. My wife can tell you this. I I'm doing it right now. When I get excited, I talk too fast, so, so sometimes in my sermons, I talk too fast, but we do have recordings of it, okay? <laughs> and you can put on slower speed, you can listen to it while you're driving. But if you're some of those who have trouble sleeping, you can also listen to it as well. But I apologize. I don't plan to speak fast, but when I get excited, or if I'm scared, like if I broke some glass, I talked to my wife as I broke that glass, but you know what I'm saying? So I apologize, but you can listen to it online on YouTube, okay? Cleveland KCPC EM. Let's pray. <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face be upon you and be gracious to you. And may the light of his goodness and grace and splendor be upon you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you.